Wilson family team up here today. Thank you, everybody from the Wilsons. Good job. And lest, lest you think they didn't let Colin in on the act, Colin was back doing, uh, doing the words. Good job, Colin. So we had the whole Wilson family involved. So that's great. I see uh, we've got Matt Sarver, and, and you guys are in the house today. Is this the last weekend before the big day? All right. Well, it's good to have you here on the weekend before. So next time we see you, will be Mrs. and Mrs. Matt Sarver, something like that. Yeah, awesome. Cool. All right. <clears throat> Wanted to uh, just uh, share a, a bit briefly from Pastor Don. I talked to him by email after we heard the word from uh, the Supreme Court. A uh, decision that they made probably uh, didn't strike joy in all of our hearts, but uh, Pastor Don said uh, he just wanted to encourage us all just to be in prayer. He wants to address it when he comes back, so he just asked us to be in prayer. Fortunately, we all recognize that that didn't take God by surprise. Uh, he knew what was going to happen before it ever happened, and so we just uh, rest in the Lord and wait, I guess is what we uh, would ask you to do. Just continue to be in prayer. All right. I didn't do a very good job with the clicker last time, so... If I forget again, you guys just carry me through, all right? We're going to pick up where Pastor Don left off, and this week will be Full Throttle, Part 5. I don't know how to say that in anything exotic, so it's Part 5. And Pastor Don entitled uh, this message, No Limits, so that's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> I want to share with us some uh, scripture. I guess that showed up all right. I just made that one up. Wow, who'd have figured? I could make up a PowerPoint frame. <clears throat> but as I uh, put this together, I sent the notes to the tech guys, and then, of course, promptly, as soon as I did that, I decided I'm going to read this out of the message. So I'm going to share this out of the message today. So if you want to follow along, we're in Hebrews 11. We're going to read the first 11 verses, which I... <clears throat> think will uh, be a good uh, background for what we want to talk about today. So Hebrews 11 starts with verse 1, which says, Each of these people of faith died. Let me back up here. I got one of those Bibles. It's got four versions together, so excuse me. It started, started at the end instead of the beginning. <clears throat> the fundamental fact of existence, that sounds better, is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. I just thought I had to read it out of the message since it included firm foundation, right? You don't have that every day. <clears throat> it's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word that we can see created by what we don't see. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know that the basis, we know now, we know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. That's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. By faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see and acted on what he was told. The result? His family was saved. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the righteousness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. Well, that we could all say that, right? By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in that country promised him. 
lived as a stranger, camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real, eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. By faith, a barren Sarah was able to become pregnant, old woman as she was at the time, because she believed that one who made a promise would do what he said. That's how it happened that from one man's dead and shriveled loins, there are now people numbering into the millions. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would make this word come alive to us today. So we look into this word on living a no limits life through you. We just pray that you'd give us the faith to accept anything that you put before us and that you would put before us things that would move the kingdom forward by leaps and bounds, Lord. We just ask it all in precious name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. All right. Good to have you here for second service. I wanted to give a special shout out to the family at Fairview Nursing Home. I get to go and minister to them once a month, and so hopefully they're back online and, and uh, watching the live stream today, and most of them watch the second service, so hopefully they get a chance to see me in a different context here today. It's always nice to have a family scattered around the city. <clears throat> so, as we look today at, at the fifth part of our, our uh, series, Full Throttle and No Limits, um, when we look at what the full throttle life might be, we're going to look at what is a life with no limits because we serve an unlimited God, don't we? Amen? We serve an unlimited God. He doesn't have any boundaries. He doesn't know any limitations. He created the universe, and I think he did a pretty good job. So he's the God that's more than enough, the God of plenty, the God who has excess abundance of anything and everything. And so it's uh, in that context that we want to continue to look at what it means to live a full throttle life with no limits. Too many times, I'm afraid, we limit God. And I include myself in that, obviously. Um, many of us have put God in a box. I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a pretty conservative church. Um, we had a box for God, you know. Nobody would say that, but we had a box, and God could do certain things, and he couldn't do certain things. So one of the realities of life is if we want to live a life that doesn't have any limits, we've got to figure out how to break that box down, don't we? We've got to figure out how to take God out of the box and let God be God and just do what he wants us to do. <clears throat> so that's the challenge for us today is to... Uh, put away some of the things that we may have built up as boundaries around God and what he can do. <clears throat> as we turn our, tar our hearts toward God, and as we come to know God in a new way, we need to figure out the way to live a no-limit lifestyle, to do what we need to tap into our Abba Father, our no-limit God, because that's the only way we can do great things for him. So how can we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. We do that by having faith in God. That's why I read that scripture passage out of Hebrews, because I think that gives us a lot of good concrete examples of how God moved in times of the Bible in people's lives. Who would have thought that somebody Sarah's age could have a baby? I mean, it uh, doesn't make any sense in human terms, does it? It only makes sense in God's eyes, right? So if we don't have faith in God, then we're not going to be able to see him move and work in our lives, right? So that's kind of the premise I'm going to work from today. I'm going to try and <clears throat> build a case. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to try and build a case for the importance of faith in our working with uh, God and living a no-limit life with God. So I want to go back to that same passage and uh, review Hebrews 1. 11 verses 1, which goes like this in the Amplified. Now faith is the assurance of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. I think that says a lot about what faith is. I mean, you can't, you can't take this and 
prove it to anybody. Lots of people will throw that in your face when you tell them you need to accept the Word of God as, as the basis for Christian life. But a lot of people will say, well, you can't prove that to me. And that's where faith comes in, isn't it? We don't have to prove the Bible is true because we've seen God, we've experienced God move in our lives, and we experience Him on a daily basis, hopefully, as He moves and guides and directs in our life. So that's the basis. And I thought of an example that might help you understand the basis of faith. He's leaving already. They're dropping like flies. Sorry. <laughs> He's coming back. <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. I just couldn't pass it up. As I thought about <clears throat> what kind of an example might help us understand faith, I thought about what we called the trust fall as I was growing up. Trust fall. Some of you may have experienced that where as a either a team building or a faith building exercise. They would gather people. I see the Prisics are here today. Welcome back, newlyweds. Good to have you guys here. I just, sorry, I just noticed you. <laughs> um, we would gather a group of people in a short circle, and we'd put somebody in the middle, and the circle would be close enough that we could basically reach out and touch the person in the middle. Then we'd blindfold the person, and we'd turn them around, turn them around until they were disoriented, and then tell them, okay, now as a faith-building venture, we want you to fall backwards and just trust that the people around the circle are going to catch you. Anybody ever do that? It's quite an exercise. It's quite an exercise for somebody my size to assume that somebody <laughs> my wife's size is going to catch me. So, so that's the challenge in that. But I thought that's kind of the basis for what we need to, to use as our our basis for faith. If we can, can trust things that we can't see and don't know for sure are going to happen, that's going to be a start of where our faith in God is going to keep moving us forward, isn't it? So we're going to have to trust that God's Word is true, even though we can't see it, necessarily can't validate it. And so faith gives us the ability to trust God for anything. That's our hope as we uh, walk forward in a, in a no-limit life with God. So then let's go to Hebrews 6, Hebrews 11, 6. And in the NIV, it says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So faith is the way we connect with God, isn't it? Anyone that believes in God, He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So if we want to live <clears throat> a no-limit life, we have to connect with our no-limit God, don't we? There's no other way to do it. When we tap into an unlimited God, then our lives will have unlimited potential, won't they? Amen. So in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, in the NIV version, it says we live by faith and not by sight. So if that's the way we should function, it's the way we have to live if we want to live a no-limit life, isn't it? Now, that same faith that helped us be born again is the same faith that works in the everyday receiving of the promises of God that He has in His Word for us, isn't it? Now, how many of you have given your hearts and life to the Lord? Probably most of us in here have done that. <clears throat> well, how, how did we get saved, I guess, is a good question that we can talk about today. Let's, let's go to Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. In the NIV, it goes like this. In verse 8, it says, But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, we've all heard that verse, right? And verse 10 says, For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So how did we get saved? We got saved by believing in our hearts and confessing our, our, uh, our sins and believing that Jesus was our Lord and Savior, didn't we? <clears throat> so how do we receive the unlimited resources of our God? The same way. We believe in our heart and declare with our mouth that God can do anything and everything through us. Let's look at Mark 11, verses 22 and 23, which says in the NIV, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. 
Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that they say it, believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read the Bible, I've done that a time or two, probably more than a time or two. I go and I read that passage and I say, okay, Lord, let's just test this out. So I'm going to say to that mountain, go throw itself in the sea. You know how many times that's happened for me? None. And why do you think that is? I don't think God's in the business of showing off. I think he's in the business of proving himself when we have a need or a situation. And that, I think, is when God will move. God has plenty of ways to show off. Every time I walk around my yard or see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise, I think, wow, that's amazing. God created a universe that declares without a single unction that God is God and we are not. The more we as human beings understand, the more we understand that there's no way to comprehend what God has done in his creation. Every time we think we've got it figured out, we understand that there's more and more and more to this creation that God has created. It's simply amazing. <clears throat> so hopefully we can build and have a faith that will allow for huge moves of God in our lives. And through us and in us, he can accomplish great things. And I'm convinced that that's our challenge today, is to believe God for more than we've ever believed him before in our lives. So I'm going to try and outline for you five things that I believe we need to be able to do to live a no-limit, full-throttle life. And so if you want to follow along with me, <clears throat> I'm going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14 and spend a little time there. 1 Samuel 14, a little background for that as you're flipping through if you want or as you're looking on your phone, it always takes me a moment to get my phone to comply with where I want to go. But uh, Saul is king here in Israel and his son Jonathan is in his army as well and uh, we're going to start in 1 Samuel 14 and read verses 1 and 2 to start with. In the NRV it says, One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistines' outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migran. So what was Paul doing? He was, uh, he'd heard God say that I want you to destroy the Philistines. So he had gone out to battle and they were, I don't know if you'd call it a stalemate or if they were just waiting for something to happen, but they were just kind of chilling. So Saul was there just uh, doing his best to be ready if God said to move, I believe, is one way to look at it. And then um, Jonathan decides that we got to do something here to move this forward. So... Um, Jonathan basically said, I'm tired of sitting. I want to go and do something. I'm tired of just waiting for the Philistines perhaps to come and attack us. I want to go and do something big for God. So in verses uh, 4 to 7 in 1 Samuel 14, it goes on like this. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One that was called Boaz and the other Sinai. And one cliff stood to the north towards, well, let's, if I put my notes the right way, it would help. One was on the north towards Michmash, and the other was on the south towards Gibeah. Jonathan said to his young arbor bear, come, let's uh, go over to the outpost of the uncircumcised men, the Philistines. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saying, saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, and I am with you in heart and soul. <clears throat> so, Jonathan said, let's go to the Philistine outpost, and let's see what the Lord's going to do. Then if we look at verse 8, here's his plan. In verse 8, Jonathan said, come on then, we'll cross over towards them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait here until we come to you, then we'll wait. 
and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we'll climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So he put out a fleece. He said, okay, God, I'm going to go out. I'm going to do this. But if you want me to go and attack them, you're going to have to let them say, come up to us. All right. Good plan. Give the Lord a challenge. He's always up to it. So what did Jonathan do? He went through the pass, and he started calling them names. How many of you know that's a great way to get a response? Yep, just start calling somebody names, and they're likely to respond, right? So he did that. He's yelling at them. And, uh, and they said, of course, the magic words. Why don't you come up to us if you're so big and so bad? Come on up here, and we'll see who's big and bad. John said, ah, there's the word. So he says to his armor bearer, let's go. We're going up. So I don't know about you, but I can imagine that that probably wasn't a 10-foot cliff. I'm guessing it was pretty tall. So they're climbing, and they're climbing, and they're climbing, and probably not like today where they've got you belayed off a rope from the top. They're probably climbing freehand, so probably bloody fingers and everything, and by the time they get to the top, they're probably pretty well spent, I would imagine. So they get to the top, and what do they find? They're outnumbered, 10 to 1. Great, thanks God, you brought us up here, and now you're going to annihilate us as soon as we get up here. But no, God had a different idea. And in 1 Samuel 14, 8 to 10, it says, uh, oh, getting behind myself here. So they got up to the top, and then in 1 Samuel 14, verse 15, then panic struck, uh, I'm getting behind myself and ahead of myself both. They get up to the top. And God gives them these 20 guys. So they kill these 20 guys, right? Okay, so they've got the first part of it done. Then, in verse 15, panic struck the whole Philistine army. Those in the camp and in the field and those in the outpost and raiding parties all around. And the ground shook. I think God was doing something there, wasn't he? It was a panic sent by God. So what happened? You all probably remember the story. The Philistines turn on themselves and start killing themselves. So they have this going on. The Philistines are fighting amongst themselves, and Saul hears the commotion and says, Whoa, what's going on? Something must have happened, and I didn't know anything about it. Somebody went on a raiding party without telling me. We better go help. So they went out, and the Philistines had basically killed themselves by the time Saul ever got there. So Paul was playing defense, wasn't he? So he was on the defensive. God moved in a miraculous way without Saul ever lifting a finger is the way I read it. So the first thing we have to do if we want to live a no-limits life is unlike Saul who is playing on the defense, we've got to start playing on the offense is what I would suggest. So how do we do that? Well, we need to get off our blessed assurance probably as part of the, part of the way we do that need to go in and we need to possess the land like, like they did. We need to start doing because here's what faith is. Faith believes and therefore faith acts is what the Bible tells us. James says without faith, works is dead. You can say I believe all day long if you want, but if you don't act on it, it's going to do you no good. You can believe all day that Jesus is Lord, but unless you confess him as Lord, You'll die and go to hell believing Jesus is Lord because you never acted on your faith. So the Philistines are routed. In 1 Samuel 14, verse 23, it says, So on that day the Lord saved Israel, and the battle moved on. So they came to a conclusion. The battle was theirs, the Lord had given it into their hands, and they moved on. So one decision, one step, why not give God a chance is a good question. Why not start playing offense instead of defense? Why not go for it instead of sitting on our blessed assurance? You see, Saul was playing not to lose, but Jonathan was playing to win, wasn't he? Amen. Holding out for God or going out all out for God, we have to serve an unlimited God. So how are we going to follow him? How are we going to step out in faith? Here's maybe what playing it safe or operating on a defensive mode might look like. I hear in my heart that this is what I should do, this is where I should go, or this is what I should accomplish. Okay, then when everything comes together, 
I'm going to be ready to go. When all the resources come in, when all the volunteers are gathered up, when I have all the staff. You know, Pastor Don could have said a long time ago, you know, when we have a staff of 20, then we'll really start doing ministry. But he didn't do that, did he? No. When he was here by himself, he did everything. And then as I came on, you know, I helped do some of the things that he used to do so he could do other things and do better at those things. So it's all a process, isn't it? But if we uh, are going to serve an unlimited God, we have to do something and we have to start somewhere. Um, but if we play to win versus playing not to lose, that's going to be the key, I think. So if we wait until we're ready, we could be waiting, waiting the rest of our lives, couldn't we? What are we doing for the kingdom? What about asking God to show us what he wants us to do and then actually doing it? Isn't that a novel thought? What about saying yes when Pastor Don or somebody says, we need help in this area or that? And one of the things we sometimes hear when we're asking for help with the kids' ministry is we sometimes hear that, well, kids aren't really my thing. Well, I don't know if you noticed or not, but if you looked around before the kids left, kids are our thing. They really are. We've got a ton of kids, and so what better place to plug in and do something for the kingdom than in kids' ministry? I tell you, you could do a lot worse than being a blessing to our little ones. You know, the, the church of tomorrow needs to be trained up today if it's going to be functional tomorrow, doesn't it? So that's a great thing. Sometimes, you, if we don't hear God saying, this is what I want you to do, it's easy to think that, well, maybe that means he doesn't need me to do anything. But I don't think that's the case. I think rather, if we don't hear God saying, go here and do this, then he's probably saying, just be available to do whatever needs to be done. And that's a great position to be in. I think everybody should have a ministry for the body of church to work correctly here. Can anybody say Amen. I think everybody needs to have a ministry. Maybe, maybe your ministry isn't working with kids, and we certainly don't want kids working with kids that hate working with kids. I mean, that's kind of nonproductive, but, but everybody has something they can do. Jason and Erica, they can build great crosses, can't they? Amen. You know, we can all do stuff, and we got stuff that needs to be fixed around here all the time. I don't know how many times I've put that door stopper back on that door going out of the sanctuary because the little kids love to get between those doors and then they do this. <laughs> they do their chin-ups or whatever they're doing. Before you know it, there goes the old uh, door stopper. So there's always something to be fixed. So maybe that's something you could help out with. Or maybe you like working outside. You know, a couple weeks ago I spent a couple, two or three days doing this. I was spraying the weeds in the parking lot. You know, weeds in the parking lot got to be killed. You know, it might not be the best use of my time or Pastor Don's time, but it still has to be done, right? So maybe somebody really enjoys that. God bless you. If you do, come see me. I can fix you right up. We've got a great backpack sprayer, and it just takes time, and it has to be done. It's one of those things. Bless the Lord, Merle takes care of the lawn, so I don't have to mow the lawn, but, but that needs to be done too. I mean, there's just stuff at church that has to be done, right? But it doesn't always affect the outcome of people's lives, but those things are nonetheless very necessary and have to be done. So everybody can do something. So that's my encouragement to you today. If you haven't felt the Lord say, go here and do this, just let us know that you're available, and we'll figure something out. I think one of the devil's favorite ploys is to frustrate ministry by keeping us all so busy we don't have time to help anywhere advance the kingdom, isn't it? I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but I sure do. So let's all commit today to help frustrate the devil instead by making time for the kingdom. If FFM has been a blessing in your life, how about committing today to do a return thing and bless the body here at FFM? All right, the second thing that I think we need to do after we firstly play the offense, I think secondly, we need to remove the lids that are in our lives. What are some of the lids that we've put on God? Well, we talked about it before in the boxes, and it's the same with lids. Sometimes we say, well, God can do this, and God can't do that. Well, 
I don't know if God can work this out. We tend to put limitations on what can do, God can do in and through us, don't we? We tend to put lids on, and we need to take the lids off and say, God is a God of any and all possibilities. But here's what most people do when they get to an intersection that says, here's the easy route or here's the impossible. I don't know about you, but my first inclination is to take the easy route, right? I think I can use Aaron as an example, can't I? We, we had a couple conversations in Pastor Don's office, didn't we, about the easy road or the hard road? And I'm here to tell you, I believe Aaron chose the hard road. He's here today because he just completed basic training for the Marines. And by the look of you, man, it was not the easy road. If I, if I could go to basic training, maybe I could look like you. I don't know about that, but it'd be a good start. But I want to commend you for not taking the easy road, sir, because I believe that it sets you on a course and a direction that will give you a chance to be a blessing the rest of your life. And we will continue to pray for you that God will keep you safe if you ever get in harm's way. Because I believe he'll use you. And don't think he's just going to use you to protect this country, but he's going to use you for the kingdom too. So don't turn your back on any opportunity that comes your way because the kingdom is yours, my brother. And I believe you're in a place where you can use it to good advantage. <clears throat> so we got to take the lids off. we got to trust that God can do through us what we don't know that he can do. But God lives in the impossible, doesn't he? Amen. When you see a road sign that says you can't or you're not qualified, you're not good enough, that's really the path to take, isn't it? Because now we're going to go down that path not based on our abilities, not based on our qualifications, but on God's abilities and God's qualifications, aren't we? You all have heard the old saying that God doesn't choose the qualified. He qualifies, qualifies the chosen. I think that's true. I think we too often think we can't do something. When in reality, if we had a willing heart and mind, God would qualify us to do that. So I think that's a great challenge to us today. <clears throat> as soon as we let go of our thoughts about whether we have the ability to do something or not, that's probably the place where God can start to use us. So David took the lid off an entire army of Israel. When he saw Goliath, he said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? He took the lid off, didn't he? He says, I'm going to go for it. So here's this little runt of a guy, a shepherd, and he's going to take on the biggest, baddest Philistine in their whole army. I don't know about you, but that probably doesn't rank at the top of my list of to-dos. It's to take on somebody that everybody else is quaking in their boots. Everybody else is saying, whoa, look out, here comes the big bad Philistine again. But David recognized it for what it was. It was an attack of the God of Israel at that point, wasn't it? So he was all set to do battle, and he did battle. He took off the lid. He said he was going for it. Moses took off the lid, didn't he? God said, lead my people out of Israel. And he said, I can do that. He goes to Pharaoh and uh, go through that whole thing with all the different um, curses. Uh, that's not the right word, but all the different things. Huh? Plagues, thank you. It escaped me at the moment. Went through all the plagues, and so eventually they got out of Israel out of Egypt, and so what happened next? They come up to the Red Sea. So then they have to say, well, okay, Lord, you've taken us out of Egypt. Now we're going to get slaughtered by the Red Sea. No, God had a better plan. Let's just work, march on through on dry land. So they had a great thing. And Moses went on to do more and more things. When they needed food in the desert, what did they get? Manna. What did they get? Quail. Time and time again, they got a cloud to lead them in the day and a torch of fire to lead them at night. So 
they had seen God move in all these miraculous ways, but when they went to the, go into the promised land, what did Moses say? I can't believe God for that. So how many times do we do that? We see God move time after time after time, and yet when push comes to shove, we can't believe that God is willing and God is able to move in anything that comes our way, do we? I know I do that. I suspect many of us struggle that way too. So that's our challenge today is not to put limits on God, not to assume that we know what he can and can't do, but to move forward in faith. <clears throat> we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are his offspring, so let's start acting and living like his offspring rather than weaklings that we sometimes act like. Let's like we have the daddy that has no lack and no shortage of power. <clears throat> Let's live like Abba Father is in charge and our daddy controls the universe which he designed and we can move whenever we say, God, I come to you by faith and I ask that you move in this situation. And I can guarantee you God will move. We just have to have the faith to believe it. <clears throat> you know, church, the coolest thing that's been happening around here is... is uh, just everything that's gone on in the last three or four years. It's not because you have the best leadership of any church in town, I can assure you that. It's just simply been God. Because what, what all has happened here in the last three or four years, planted a church in Kalamazoo, paid off a $750,000 loan on our building, um, planned a new building, and we're getting ready to minister to our kingdom kids in a new way that we've never been able to do before with more space and just a multitude of things. But I think the greatest thing that has happened around here is the attitude of you, the people of this church, that are getting to the point where we say we're ready to move. We're ready to move. God, use us to move the kingdom forward. Here in Centerville and wherever you put us, we're ready to move the kingdom of God forward, and that's a great thing. We're excited about that. So the second thing that we want to do is take the lids off what we believe God to do. And then I think the third thing is we want to get a vision for what God wants us to do. And that's probably going to be birthed through God's Word and birthed through prayer. So we've got to have a vision. How many of you know that without vision the people perish, right? It's one of the things I appreciate, Pastor Don. He's always laying out the vision. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? What's God doing? So... We have to have a vision, but we need to get that vision in the Word. So if we spend time in the Word, we can eliminate some stuff from our life. Then, who knows, maybe some things need to be cut. You know, I, I know in our life there was, there was a time when we didn't have time for anything. We were busy at camp. We had three kids. And there's many of you in the same situation. But there's a time when something has to go. And so let's just examine our lives and see if there's things that God wants to say, it's time for this to go in your life so you have time to do kingdom work. I think that would be a good thing. We serve a God that's more than enough. He is able to do anything far and above what we could ever imagine or dream. We serve a God that says, whatever man's report is, my report is greater than that. Just ask Gay and Carrie Large. Gary and Kay Large. So that backwards real fast. They would, I can't wait for the day when Gary can come back to church because they will give a testimony, I'm sure, if he's willing to stand up and do it, of how they've seen God walk with them day by day, hour by hour, incident by incident. Every time that he goes in for a test or a procedure, the medical staff are just amazed, and Gary's always willing to say, it's because I know a good God. And he's on my side, and he's fighting for me. So every time he comes through, he got to come home Friday. Got to come home Friday. And he was so encouraged. When I went over to see him Friday, he was, he was tired, but he was very encouraged because they told him it'd be another week till he got to come home. But he said, I'm not believing that. I'm believing my God has the power to restore my health day by day, and he has been. So please continue to pray for them and Strength comes day by day, but he is so encouraged, and I'm looking forward to hearing a testimony from him about what he's seen God do in their lives through this whole 
event and chapter. <clears throat> so the third thing that we need to do is, like I said, we have to get a vision, and that vision comes by hearing the Word of God. So as we feed on God's Word, it fills our heart with faith to be able to take action steps. So here's what happens in prayer. Prayer gives us the ability to see things before it happens, doesn't it? We can see things through prayer, and so I can encourage you, if you want to see things before they happen, come join us Wednesday night at 6.30. We're always here for prayer, and we welcome everybody to come join us. Prayer changes things, so if you want to see God move, I would encourage you to spend some time here with us before church and prayer. You don't have to pray out loud. Just come and see what God will do in your heart and uh, what he might do to help you make time to spend time on kingdom business. So... If you can see it with faith, then we'll be able to take step number four, which I believe is taking bold, daring steps of faith. So what does a bold, daring step of faith look like? Well, why would we do that? Or why? Because we saw it in the Spirit. We saw it in our prayer time. God births visions in our hearts. God said, if you climb up there, if you go out to the Philistine outpost, and you let me take you there, I will give you victory in that. So Jonathan did that. That was a daring step of faith, I believe. So men, if we can go, why not see if the Lord, by the hand of few or many, will use us in the kingdom? I totally believe that Jonathan, Jonathan saw that in his heart before he ever took those steps to do what he did to start that amazing battle with the Philistines. But the only thing that he could do when he got up on that ledge and saw how badly he was outnumbered, the only thing he could do that would give him the courage to do that was yell, charge! And so he went forward with the power of God and took care of those Philistines that vastly outnumbered him. So he began the process, and then we recall the story before about how God moved and the whole Philistine army killed themselves. And so we have to be able to see what God wants us to do before we take an action step of faith. So what did Jonathan do when they said, hey, I dare you to come up there? He did it, didn't he? And that's what we need to do. One step, one decision can change our lives forever. What did Jesus say? If you believe in your heart, speak it to the mountain and don't doubt it. The mountain will be thrown into the sea. Those are the situations and circumstances where we need to challenge God to move in our lives. When we see a mountain in front of us, then God can do what we couldn't do on our own. In uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 to 47, uh, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give you to the carcass, your carcass to the birds and to the wild beasts, and the whole world will know that God of Israel is in command. So he took a bold step of faith, didn't he? And uh, we're talking about a giant. You know, it wasn't a small thing. You know, he told him he was going to kill him and feed him to the birds and the beasts. So look how he finishes. In verse 47, all those who gather there will know that this is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it all to you into your hands. So are we ready? Some of us need to start speaking out, don't we? Some of us need to start talking to the giants in our lives, don't we? Some of us need to start declaring God's word and God's promise that I'll live and I'll not die. I'm an overcomer, and I'm not going to be defeated. We need to, um, we need to say, I'm going to win. I know what it looks like. I might be behind now, but I'm going to win. We need to boldly declare that we're going to see more people come to God, and I believe in all my heart that we're at a place in our church's life where we're going to see more and more people daily fall in love with Jesus again than we've ever seen before, and I think we're ready. We're on a precipice. I think, of being able to live a no-limit life for God. And I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited about what I see in people's lives around us. It's just so encouraging. God's will is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. 
It's not a safety. It's not a play a defensive game. It's an offensive plan. Some people say, what if the Lord doesn't show up? What if I climb the cliff and I start to fight and the Philistines win? Well, here's what I think. I think I'd rather fall on my face for God than sit on my butt for myself. You know? Let's just go out there and do something. What's the worst that can happen? If God allows us not to gain victory and everything, and we would happen to get killed for Christ? What's the worst that can happen? We spend eternity with God? You know, that's not such a bad thing, is it? You know, we have to take some risks and allow God to move in our lives. I'm just, uh, I'm just not going to sit here on the throne and, and spend some time with God. We just have to get up and do something. Do something for the kingdom of heaven. The path of least resistance is what makes rivers and people crooked. Do you ever think about that? The littlest creek ends up looking like a snake, doesn't it? As it meanders through a field somewhere. Why is that? Because it's taken the path of least resistance, right? It just goes wherever the flow is. So somebody has to get out there and get a big earth mover, and they've got to straighten that puppy back out, and then it'll run on the straight course again. But it'll just continue to do that. So we have to make sure that we don't do the same thing. The path of least resistance is not the path we want to go. We want to start doing some things and believing things that we don't know whether we can do them or not, but we're going to trust God to do things in and through us. I love this statement by Mark Patterson, who said, Goals are dreams with targets on them. Goals are dreams with a bullseye. So how about if we start getting some dreams, listening to God, see what he wants us to do, get some dreams and put them up on the refrigerator and put some bullseyes on them and say, this is what that looks like. And this is what we're going to take our eye and pursue for a while. <clears throat> That's what we can do if we've got God on our side. We can say, God, this is possible because we understand there's no limits when you're living for us and we're living for you. So why do we look for excuses and reasons that we can't do something for the kingdom? Why not look for opportunities as opposed to looking for excuses not to do things? Why not give God a chance? Why are people afraid of making mistakes instead of saying, why not? Why not go up and take the land? Why are people afraid of missing God? It's always a question. Let's start taking the offensive rather than always being on the defensive. So the last thing that I want to talk about, the fifth thing that I think we need to do to live a no-limit life is we need to charge at what we fear the most. We need to charge at what we fear the most. If we want to live a no-limits life, then we need to charge at the things that are holding us back. 1 Samuel 17, 48 says, As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. So, David didn't shrink around trying to find a, a weak area in Goliath's defense. He went right after him, didn't he? He went right after him and charged into his life because he believed God was going to give him the victory, and he did. Peter got out of the boat, and he started walking on water. Until what? He doubted. Yep. John said, Jonathan said, let's climb. And he climbed and won a great victory. And, of course, David ran at Goliath. But if you go that route, if you take that journey, there's not going to be too many people with you on that road, is there? Did you notice that it was just Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing the cliff? Yep. All the other guys are content. We're just content to just hang out with King Saul. Let's just hang out here and wait for God to move. But Jonathan wasn't there. So if we decide to live a no-limit lifestyle, it's going to be a lonely path sometimes because people are going to call you crazy, right? The Bible calls us to be a peculiar people, doesn't it? Yeah, I think crazy may be a modern-day term for that. So I'd rather they call me crazy than call me normal, right? I'd rather not fit into this world's mold. I don't want to fit into what Christians should do and be. I don't want to fit into that. So if you fear man, you'll offend God in all likelihood, won't we? But if we fear God, in turn, we're probably going to offend some people, aren't we? So we're not going to please everybody. Choose this day whom you will serve. Do you want to be a man pleaser or a God pleaser? I don't care what you think about me. I care more about what God thinks about me. 
I want to please my Father, and I want to do my Father's will. And I want to hear him say, go get him, son. That's my boy, just like he did to Jesus. We're going to be cut out of the same mold if we can get to the place where we can say, I'm going to go get him. That's what I want to do, and that's what I want to be in every facet of every area of my life. And that's what, as your leaders here at FFM, we want for you all to be able to do too. We love to be referred to as those crazy people at FFM doing something crazy for God again. What a great testimony that would be. I want to close with this story. A true story from the Civil War, Pastor Don says, from July 2nd, 1863, 1863, July 2nd, 1863. Some of you may remember this story. <laughs> or not. A school teacher, anyway, he had been a school teacher a year before, was now out on the battlefield. His name was Colonel Joshua Chamberlain. He had 300 soldiers in his command that day. That's all that stood between him and the Confederate Army in certain defeat outside Gettysburg that day. At 2.30 p.m., the 15th and 47th Alabama Infantry of the Confederate Army was charging. Chamberlain and his men held them off. That was followed by a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth charge by the Confederate Army. Chamberlain was down to 80 men left, and it looked like absolute defeat. A little boy that was in a tree watching things going on the other side of the line said, Colonel, they're mounting up for another attack. All of his men found that they were low on ammunition. They were just about out. Colonel Chamberlain made one bold, crazy decision. He brings his junior officers together there on a hill, and he knows that he's only got one chance. He says, men, put on your bayonets. We're almost out of ammunition, and we've got one chance. He climbed to the edge of the barricade, raised his sword, and in the midst of an absolute promise of defeat, he cried, charge and they ran down the hill at the confederate army and they go to tell us that in the next five minutes those 80 soldiers captured over 4,000 confederate soldiers one crazy suicidal i might flop on my face move but he said he'd rather flop on his face than die sitting on his hind end didn't he would you stand with me I don't know if Greg Johnson's still around. He's over there somewhere. Come on up here, Mr. Greg. I don't know if Adam's here. Is Adam, Adam Kraft around? Come on up here, Mr. Greg. Some of you might not know Greg Johnson. He's one of the newest family members at FFM, right? Yep. It's been four weeks now, maybe? A little over a month. Okay, a little over four weeks. One of the things that, that I love about this church is people are always willing to go out on a limb. So one of the things that I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to do is try and help guide the care for new families and new, and new visitors. And so one of the times that Greg moved to the community and stopped in to see what was going on at Firm Foundation, I sent Adam and Johnny McNall out to visit him afterwards. So... If you're new and you get a call from Adam, it's probably because I told him to call you and go visit you. But anyway, they went out and visited Greg, and so it wasn't long before in that first visit, Greg decided he was going to trust the Lord with his heart and life. So welcome to the family, brother. But that's one of the things, yep, amen, give the, give the Lord a hand. But that's one of the things that's so awesome about this church. People are willing to step out and do things that might be outside their comfort zone. I'm sure... Adam has done it a million times, but every time there's probably a little doubt in his heart whether he's going to say the right thing or do the right thing. But it doesn't matter whether we say or do the right thing. If God's leading us, good things will happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you would admit that God's delivered you from some stuff, and he's probably going to continue yeah. delivering you from some stuff. But welcome to the family of God, brother. It's good to have you as part of our FFM family. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. <clears throat> So there's probably a time in our life when we need to stand up and do something for God that might not be comfortable. Some of us may need to stand up and yell charge at our marriage or our job or any of a number of things that are holding us back from doing what God wants us to do. 
So I guess my challenge to us today, if we want to serve a God with no limits, we need to live like we're his children. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that we serve a God that doesn't have limits. We want to live, Father, like you would have us live. We want to see the potential in ourselves that you see, but we don't sometimes. We want to we realize that you see our abilities when we only see inabilities, Father. So we have insecurities that you find and fill our lives with security in Christ. So you don't see what we can't do, but Father, we know that you see what we can do through Christ who strengthens us. So you see in this place an auditorium filled and overflowing with no limit people. And so, Father, we've limited ourselves many times and we've limited you, but today, Lord, we want to take the lid off of our faith. We want to have you help us to take us to the next level, to live a no-limit life through your power and through your glory. Lord, we just thank you for the fresh fire and the fresh vision that you're going to put in our lives. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'd like to challenge you to